Our second lesson this morning comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 16, verses 16 through 24. This is Jesus talking to his disciples. A little while and you will no longer see me, and again a little while and you will see me. Then some of his disciples said to one another, what does he mean by saying to us, a little while and you will no longer see me, and again a little while and you will see me, and because I am going to the Father. They said, what does he mean by this a little while? We do not know what he is talking about. Jesus knew they wanted to ask him, so he said to them, are you discussing among yourselves what I meant when I said, a little while and you will no longer see me, and again a little while and you will see me? Very truly, I tell you, you will weep and mourn, but the world will rejoice. You will have pain, but your pain will turn into joy. When a woman is in labor, she has pain because her hour has come, but when her child is born, she no longer remembers the anguish because of the joy of having brought a human being into the world. So you have pain now, but I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your joy from you. On that day, you will ask nothing of me. Very truly, I tell you, if you ask anything of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive, so that your joy may be made complete. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Caroline Lewis is a seminary professor who recently published a commentary on the Gospel of John. Any of us who've spent any time with this gospel know that it contains a lot of difficult passages. But Lewis readily admits that the passages she struggles with the most are those in which Jesus is talking to his disciples about joy. Looking at the world in which Jesus lived with its intractable, intractable poverty, an occupying government that was hopelessly corrupt, torture, sanctioned by the state, and knowing that Jesus himself would be tortured to death on a cross, how is it that on the last night of his life, Jesus is talking about joy? When he speaks the words we just heard, Jesus knows what is in store for him, and he also knows that his death is going to make things harder on his followers. So it's hard not to feel like these words are, as Lewis puts it, out of place, out of sync, out of time. How can Jesus, who knows that he must endure horrific suffering, be so full of joy? The poet Stephen Dunn reveals something about this strange relationship between suffering and joy, although he never actually uses the word joy, in his poem entitled, Sweetness. Just when it has seemed I couldn't bear one more friend waking with a tumor, one more maniac with a perfect reason, often a sweetness has come and changed nothing in the world except the way I stumbled through it for a while lost in the ignorance of loving someone or something, the world shrunk to mouth size, hand size, and never seeming small. I acknowledge there is no sweetness that doesn't leave a stain, no sweetness that's ever sufficiently sweet. Tonight, a friend called to say his lover was killed in a car he was driving. His voice was low and guttural. He repeated what he needed to repeat, and I repeated the one or two words we have for such grief until we were speaking only in tones. Often a sweetness comes as if on loan, stays just long enough to make sense of what it means to be alive, then returns to its dark source. As for me, I don't care where it's been or what bitter road it's traveled to come so far, to taste so good. Very truly, I tell you, Jesus says to his dearest friends, you will weep and mourn. 
You will have pain, but your pain will turn into joy. The danger of this text, of course, is how easily it can be used, or really abused, to try to convince someone who is in the midst of suffering and pain that what really matters is that at some point their pain will magically turn into joy. As Christians, this is not what our faith proclaims. In fact, the proclamation of our faith is the opposite. The cross and resurrection have nothing to do with magic and everything to do with God, whose love is the most powerful force there is. Powerful enough not to undo suffering, but to transform it. Of course, this tradition comes straight to us from our Jewish brothers and sisters who never hesitate to go to God, as we heard in the psalm today, and demand that God get to work, transforming despair and sorrow into joy and hope. Such a demand is an incredible admission of trust in God's power. For us, the cross is the ultimate symbol of God's transformative power, but it is more than just a symbol. The cross is the promise that God will forge life from death, hope from despair, and joy from sorrow. Jesus says, a little while, and then you will see me. Each of us at some point in our lives, we'll find ourselves in the midst of this little while when pain and suffering overshadow our sense of God's love and presence. To give his disciples a better way to understand God's promise of transformation, Jesus uses the image of childbirth. Pregnancy and childbirth always involve some measure of pain and suffering, but they do not last forever. And when a newborn baby is placed in its parents' arms, the joy they feel does not undo the suffering they have undergone, but it helps them to see it and remember it differently. As a church, we are called to be a community of people who cling to God's promise that pain and suffering will not have the last word. We are also called to care for one another, particularly those among us who are in the midst of their little while. We are called to receive one another's pain and suffering with tenderness and hope, modeling the constant presence and unconditional love of God to one another. When Carrie O'Brien was dumped by her boyfriend one day while at work in New York City, She searched online for a place to eat lunch where she would also be able to have a good cry. The experience of searching for a place to cry in a city constantly filled with people inspired her to create a website, the NYC Crying Guide, which tells its readers the best and worst places to cry in the city. The Bank of America ATM vestibule on 59th and 5th, the Grand Central Station escalator, this particular Duane Reed Pharmacy in Midtown, all come highly recommended. After Carrie started the website, she opened it up to her readers to share their favorite places, and now, after two and a half years, there are hundreds of spots on the list. When I discovered this site, I eagerly scrolled through the posts, wondering which of New York City's beautiful old churches would be listed. Church sanctuaries are usually quiet and deserted, so surely a few would make the list. They are called sanctuaries, after all. But after scrolling through and then finally using the site's search function, I discovered not one church on the list. This confirms my fear that most of us have come to see church as the last place we would go to cry. Instead, church is the place where we expect ourselves and those around us to have it all together, to look our best and be on our best behavior. In today's text, Jesus is telling us that the joy we will 
know is inextricably tied to the suffering we now know, which suggests that if we cannot bring our whole selves with a full range of our experiences and emotions into this or any other sanctuary before God and one another, we risk missing out on this complete joy that is to come, a joy, Jesus says, that no one can take away. But here's the thing. The only way any of us will be able to bring our whole selves into this place is if we all commit to bringing our whole selves here as best we can. True Christian community is one where we do not ever require one another to pretend to have it all together or to leave our most difficult or complicated emotions at the door, not sadness or anger, sorrow or despair, confusion or doubt. Because the joy Jesus talks about is a joy that can only be complete if we experience it together. Community is where we experience the truth Jesus reveals, the truth that our joy and suffering are so tied up together they cannot be separated. Susan Stroman is a choreographer who has helped create masterpieces of dance and musical theater. Although her work is often characterized by playfulness and pleasure, she has known great sorrow in her life. After meeting her first husband late in life and surprising even herself by falling in love, he was diagnosed with leukemia soon after they married and died within months. He also worked in theater as a director, and before his diagnosis, Mel Brooks had signed them both up to work together on his new show, The Producers. After her husband died, Susan didn't think she could continue with the project. But Mel Brooks came to her and convinced her to return to the show. He said, Susan, you will cry in the morning and you will cry at night. But when you're with me during the day, you will laugh, and it will save you. Complete joy is not joy that is unconnected to anything else or that arises spontaneously with no explanation. Complete joy is joy we recognize in ourselves and in others because we have first known pain. How do we help each other recognize this joy? We do it when we acknowledge one another's suffering, when we are honest about our struggles, and when we create space where we can share how we're really doing, no matter how put together we might appear to be. There will be times when you come through those doors feeling blessed and joy-filled before worship even begins, and there will also be times when your pain and sorrow make it nearly impossible for you to enter this sanctuary. But something happens when we come together as we are, with all of the mixed up emotions each of us brings on any given day, together as one community where there is an ebb and flow of pain and sorrow, joy and hope, our joy is made complete. A friend of mine tells the story of a former church member who once wrote him a letter telling him what it was like to go to church on Easter Sunday, just a few days after his beloved wife had died after a long illness. In the letter, the man told my friend how hard it was to hear the joyful music, the alleluias and shouts of Christ is risen. Several times he thought about getting up and leaving because he said in that moment he couldn't bring himself to pray or sing or even care that God raised Jesus from the dead. But at some point in the service, he looked up from his sorrow and began to notice all the people around him. And he realized that if he couldn't pray or sing or care, that was okay because they could. And on that day, they could do those things not just for themselves, but for him as well. He also trusted that at some time in the future, he would come to church 
and be able to pray and sing and shout Alleluia and Christ is risen and do it not just for himself, but for all those in that community who, because of their pain and sorrow, could not. True joy is the gift of our loving and gracious God, who intimately knows and fully understands the depth of our suffering, and who has given us everything we need to share it and bear it together, and by, dose, by so doing, to make our joy complete. Amen.